of teaching information evening here in the learning and teaching building at uh, Monash University. Um, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, both, both past, present and emerging. Um, welcome to everyone here in the room, but also welcome to our people live streaming on YouTube today. Uh, great to have you online. Um, my name's Rebecca and I work in the Faculty of Education here at Monash. Um, I work in the professional staff teams, uh, so I'm not an academic, um, but I do work very closely with the academic teams um, and I'm here to tell you a bit of course information today. Um, we also have a couple of our lovely alumni, our graduates of the Master of Teaching here today, who are going to speak to you about some of their experiences. Um, and we also have a current student who very kindly uh, offered to help us out this evening as well. Uh, and we also have a couple of our uh, admissions and student services team here who will be helping out to answer any extra questions at the end. So just to get started, uh, we might just play a little video so I'm not talking the whole time. But we'll unmute it first. <laughs> so this is Emily. She's, uh, I actually think she's already graduated now. We filmed this last year. Coming in every day and getting to work with young people. They are just so creative and willing to give it a go. My name's Emily Davison. I'm currently a pre-service teacher doing my Masters of Teaching at Monash University. Before I enrolled in my Masters of Teaching at Monash, I lived in New York for three years where I went to the Atlantic Acting School. I spent a lot of time doing a lot of physical theatre while I was there, but also spent a bit of time working on some television shows. Like the Red Sea. Then make a path because I wasn't nothing. I did my undergraduate in acting. I actually went to NIDA in Sydney for three years. I just realised that teaching was something that really brought me a lot of joy and a lot of challenges, but also just a lot of satisfaction. So the kind of impact that I'd love to have on my students is just making them the best human beings they can be. In acting, you have to think about different characters' perspectives that might be very different from your own. If students have to explore that, it will open up their ideas and making them more conscious and I guess open-minded citizens. The great thing about Monash is that they offer secondary and primary teaching as a combined master's program. Something that I'm personally really interested in is looking at how drama can bridge that transition between grade six and year seven for students that can sometimes be you know, a difficult moment in their lives. At the moment, I'm doing um, a Drama Victoria Theatre Festival placement. It's been such an exciting experience because a lot of the students that will come into my workshop don't actually know each other, which creates a really interesting kind of electric atmosphere because they're really getting out of their comfort zone. I've just really loved having an authority over the workshops that we've been running, which means we can really, you know, rise and fall on, on our own backs, which will give us a bit of an edge going out into the real world of teaching. So that's Emily. I just, uh, I really like her video because I think it starts to demonstrate the diversity of the student cohort that we have here at Monash. Uh, we have all kinds of different people studying the Master of Teaching from all kinds of different walks of life, uh, even different countries, uh, different parts across Australia. Um, so it's a really valuable learning experience uh, to be in such a diverse cohort. Uh, because you're not just learning from your teachers or your lecturers, you're also learning from your fellow students. So, why become a teacher? So, I'm sure you've all got your own reasons. Um, of course, you're here for a reason. Um, I just wanted to share a few of the reasons that some of our students tell us um, were their main drivers for wanting to become a teacher. Uh, one of the big ones is to be able to share their passion. So, whether that is sharing 
your passion for a particular subject. Maybe you really, really love history and you just want to tell everyone about history every chance you get. Um, or you just are really excited by maths. It does happen. I, believe me, it does happen. Um, teaching is an opportunity to share your passion with younger people and get people excited about your area of interest. You might not be particularly passionate about one specific subject or a couple of specific subjects. You might just be excited about learning and about developing and about helping people grow and become leaders or become mature little people. Um, teaching gives you all of that. And you get to have that really cliched moment, but it's a cliche for a reason. The moment things change, that light bulb moment that teachers talk about. When you are explaining a concept to a class or to a student and finally something clicks and they get it. And that is just something that people over and over tell me is that amazing feeling, um, one of the most rewarding things about being a teacher. And everyone remembers their favourite teacher. Am I right? Who here remembers their favourite teacher? Hands, don't be shy. Yes? <laughs> okay, if you didn't put your hand up remembering your favourite teacher, who here remembers their least favourite teacher? Yeah, a few. <laughs> Teachers make a huge impression on people's lives. It's really... It's a really, really important job. It's an important profession uh, because you really are changing the world through the students that you teach and work with. Um, and you change yourself as well while you're on that journey. But teaching is just so important because teachers really stay with you. I definitely remember my favourite teacher, Mr Williams. English in Year 7, taught me to love poetry and Shakespeare. I know, again, it's not for everyone, but maybe that's your passion and maybe you'll be a Mr Williams one day and you'll have someone uh, 20 years later <laughs> telling people about you. So that's a few reasons why you should be a teacher. Um, I'm sure you've also got some of your own. Why should you study at Monash to become a teacher? Well, we're really, really good. <laughs> um, we are actually consistently ranked in the top 20 uh, faculties of education in the world. In the world, not Australia. Um, if you think about how many thousands of universities there are in the world, that's a pretty amazing achievement. Um, we're also currently ranked number one in Australia for education. And that's the third year in a row now that we've been ranked number one with the academic ranking of world universities. Um, and yeah, number 12 in the world for that one and number 16 in the world for the QS world rankings. Pretty great. Um, a lot of this is reflected by our academic staff. So rankings uh, don't just reflect on teaching, they also reflect on research. But the great thing about teaching is that research informs teaching. So you know that with these world rankings, you're really getting a top quality education so that you can give other people a top quality education. And our students get jobs. So that's another important one, I'm sure. I'm sure there are a lot of you here that are looking at a career change um, and are feeling maybe a little bit uncertain about the future. Um, but never fear, uh, at Monash in general um, and at Monash Faculty of Education, we really have some great employability numbers. So that's 91.2% of our students are employed within four months of graduating from their degree. That's well above the national average for uh, teaching programs. Now, just briefly, uh, I'm going to get into some course information now. Um, I'll just briefly let you know about our different campuses. Um, so we're here at the Clayton campus today. Um, that's where we are if you're on YouTube. Um, we also offer our programs, some of our programs from the Peninsula campus. Uh, for Master of Teaching, it's actually only one specialisation, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, but just want to mention that because you can't see it today. Uh, it's a lovely, um, a bit smaller campus uh, based in Frankston on the peninsula, not far from the beach, quite a nice little area. Um, lots of trees, uh, much smaller than the Clayton campus, um, so a very different feel, um, but still a really, really nice place to study. 
and of course here at Clayton. So for those of you who aren't sitting in the room, uh, this is a little bit of what our building looks like. This is the learning and teaching building. It's actually currently, probably soon to be overtaken, but currently the newest building on campus. Um, and it was designed specifically for the Faculty of Education. Um, so we really have put a lot of thought into the learning and teaching spaces in this building. It's all designed around the idea of collaborative learning, which is the way that learning environments research is going and the way that um, practical delivery of teaching is going. So it's a cool space. And it's really fun to present in a really nice, modern, fancy room like this. So if you want to become a teacher, there's three different ways you can do it at Monash. So tonight we're talking about the Master of Teaching. You need to already have a bachelor degree, the equivalent of an Australian bachelor degree, to be eligible to study a Master of Teaching. If you don't, um, I certainly don't want to kick anyone out, but you might not feel like you want to hang around for the entire presentation because we will be focusing just on the Master of Teaching this evening. If you don't already have a bachelor degree, then you could look at the Bachelor of Education Honours, either as a single degree or as a double degree. But Master of Teaching is what we're talking about tonight. So, lots of different options for teaching. Um, and just like you all have different reasons for wanting to be a teacher, I'm sure you all have different ideas about what kind of teaching you want to do. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple for the Master of Teaching. It's broken up into the different sectors of education related to the different age groups that you'll be teaching. So we offer early years education, primary education and secondary education. But those double or dual sector specialisations are really valuable, um, A, if you're not sure which way you want to go, if you're trying to toss up between one or the other, early years or primary, primary or secondary, or if you just want to keep your options open, uh, which is totally valid as well. So I'm just going to very briefly speak about the different specialisations. Um, I think a lot of it's fairly straightforward, but we do get questions about some of the different things that happen in the different uh, specialisations. So the early years education specialisation is offered here at the Clayton campus, uh, on campus only. Um, it's a two year program full time. Um, early years education, you're looking at working with children from basically zero um, through to about six years old. Um, so it's all of that sort of uh, pre-primary, preschool, kindergarten sort of field. Uh, you will also get an opportunity throughout the degree to work with uh, much younger children um, just so that you have that experience as well. So um, obviously things like childcare and those sorts of things are an option too. Um, but you will be accredited, you'll be able to register with a CEQA, which don't ask me to remember all of the different <laughs> letters in that um, acronym, but a CEQA is the national registration body for early childhood education. Um, so this degree is accredited with that body. So early years and primary education. Uh, again, Clayton, uh, two year degree. The difference here pretty straightforward. You're working with a wider range of, a uh, wider age group range. So you're looking at zero until about 12 years old. So you're incorporating the early years, you're incorporating primary and those sort of transitional years. Uh, Emily in her video talked about the transition, those early years in high school. There's also transitions, um, of course, in those early years as well. Uh, this is a great program because it really addresses a lot of those um, development and transitional issues that come up. Um, there's so much more to early years than just playing. Um, I know people think, you know, all, all people that work in kindergartens do is play with kids all day and babysit. Um, a little bit true, you do play with kids all day, but there's a purpose behind your play. Play is a really, really important part of development for children. Um, it's about motor skills, it's about brain development, um, it's about pattern recognition, all sorts of things come out through play and socialisation, of course. Um, so early years addresses a lot of those developmental um, key points so that you can really understand how to reach children and help them um, develop 
and keep up with, I guess, um, the progression as they go through their early years and through into primary. And for primary, you will, um, so this, this specialisation, you'll also have your accreditation from ASEQA, um, but you'll also have uh, the ability to register with the VIT, the Victorian Institute of Teaching. That one's a lot shorter, so I can remember that one. Um, so you'll have a dual qualification, uh, dual registration. So you can work in early childhood settings and in primary school settings as well. Um, as a part of your primary education, uh, primary teachers teach across the whole curriculum, uh, so you will be learning about all the different sorts of areas that you need to cover as a, uh, I guess what we call a generalist primary school teacher or a classroom primary school teacher. Um, so you will be covering maths, English, science, all those important areas that you need. Um, people often ask me, well, if I'm doing early years and primary, does that mean that I miss out? on something from early years or something from primary. Of course, if you're combining two areas into one, you're not going to be covering exactly the same content as someone that's doing the single early years specialisation or the single primary specialisation. There's just not enough space in two years to fit all of the stuff that you'd be studying in each of those into one. Uh, you will get all of the essential things you need to know though. And if you're doing the single specialisations, it means you'll be going a bit deeper into the specific uh, sector or the specific age group that you're studying. So that leads me to primary education. This one's a little bit different. This is the one specialisation that I mentioned that is offered at the Peninsula campus. So this one's not offered at Clayton. It's only offered at Peninsula or as an online program. So those are your two options. Um, and it's a two year, again, a two year program. Um, and again, this will cover all of the things you need to know to be a classroom primary school teacher, but you will be covering a little bit of extra content uh, than if you were doing the combined early years and primary program. You'll be working with children from about five or six years old until about 12 years old. And primary and secondary, you can see a pattern here. Um, so the difference here, uh, we actually have an accelerated option for our primary and secondary education specialisation um, and for our secondary uh, education as well. So what this means, uh, it's a, still a two year program. The official duration is two years, but instead of doing four standard semesters, you'll instead be doing three standard semesters and a summer semester. So instead of semester one, semester two, semester one, semester two, you were doing semester one, semester two, summer, semester one. And you complete your degree about six months earlier than you would if you were doing the standard mode. Um, either way is valid. They're both covering exactly the same course content, same teachers, same academics, all of those things. It's just your preference. Some people like to squeeze a little bit more in so that they can get out into the workforce a bit earlier. But whatever you want to do is fine. Um, and again, this one's at the Clayton campus. Um, and this is the one that Emily from the video was studying. So um, as she said, there's those really great transitional uh, years between primary and secondary education, which is so important in uh, a young person's life. Um, hence why my favorite teacher was my year seven teacher, helped me through those transitional years. Um, so if you study primary and secondary education, you'll be focusing half on primary on becoming a generalist or a classroom primary school teacher and half you'll be focusing on one specialist area for secondary education. Um, I'm, I'm sure that all if not most of you know that the main difference between primary and secondary is that secondary education you have a focus, you have a specialisation or a couple of specialisations. You don't have to teach everything um, whereas primary school you're, you have one class basically and you're with them for most of the day, most days of the week. So you're teaching them everything. Um, secondary, your classes will come and go. You'll have different groups of students at different times, um, usually teaching the same or similar subjects throughout that time. 
So if you're studying secondary education, you are focusing on two specialist areas. Um, again, we have this accelerated mode option for you, or you can do the standard mode and complete the degree in two years full time if you want to. Uh, Clayton Campus. Um, now, the specialist teaching areas for secondary education are quite important. Uh, because that's what you're going to be learning how to, t uh, how to teach. They're also important for your admission. So this is our lovely little list. Uh, if you've got one of our course guides on you, we do have a link to the website that lists all of these and it also lists all the requirements that you need to meet for each of these different areas. Um, and if you're playing at home, um, you can definitely ac access this from the Monash Education website, monash.edu slash education. Um, and we can also send through a link um, to a few key links um, in the post event email as well when we send that out in a few days. Um, so you can have a look at the detail that's required for these. The reason these are really important is because for secondary education at a master's level, you need to already have an academic background in the areas you want to teach. So to make it really simple, if you have a degree in science and your major was maths and maybe you had a minor in biology, you can't come and do a master of teaching and be able to teach English because you don't have any of the necessary content or discipline knowledge to be able to pursue those studies. We only have two years with the Master of Teaching, so we don't have time to teach you all of, those, all of that discipline knowledge that you need. All we have time to teach you is how to teach it. So you'll be getting a lot of, in your course structure, you'll be getting a lot of, um, not general, but I guess more uh, broad uh, education concepts that can apply to any subject. Um, so you'll be learning about curriculum, about pedagogy, about assessment, um, about development at various year levels. Um, you'll be learning about, um, I don't know, all sorts of different things. Um, can't think of more off the top of my head right now. Um, but you'll also be studying for secondary education specific what we call method units, which are the how to teach history or how to teach geography units and those are specific to your specialist areas and they're specific to what you've studied in your previous bachelor degree. So if you want to study primary and secondary education there needs to be one area from this list that you actually have a background in from your undergrad. And if you want to study just secondary education in your master's, you need to find two areas from this list or one of the ones that's listed as a double area. Uh, there are a few, just a few areas that require quite a bit of study to qualify for those, um, for those areas. So we actually can count them as a double area. And instead of doing two method subjects to learn how to teach those, you'll actually get four method subjects um, and go a lot more in depth into the teaching of those areas. Uh, but in general, you need to find two if you want to study um, secondary education. So that's a lot of the course information. Um, I just want to have a very brief break now with our lovely alumni that have come, on, uh, come along this evening to help us out. So I might ask Charlene and Suzanne to come up and have a little bit of a chat about their experiences. Do you want a microphone each or just, yeah? There you go, I've just popped them on. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlene, and I'm Suzanne. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do a bit of a tag team, and uh, hopefully you guys can stay with us. And um, yeah, so um, uh, just a bit about myself. I currently teach at Clayton North Primary School, just down the road uh, near Maccas, and. Um, graduated uh, from the Masters of Teaching last year, uh, along with Suzanne. And uh, one of the points that I considered when I was um, uh, deciding, you know, where to do my Masters of Teaching was, um, you know, as an international student, so I'm from Malaysia, 
I was definitely looking at the price points. Um, I was also looking at the ranking. <laughs> I was also looking at uh, people who had uh, graduated from the course before uh, before me. So these were some of my points that I considered. Uh, how about you, Suzanne? Um, similar. So for me, I've been here for a while and I've did my economics degree here and I worked in um, corporate world for a long time before I made the change and wanted to do something more worthwhile and work in the with special needs children. Um, so I was looking to see if I wanted to do it full-time, part-time, on campus, off campus, online, and there were key things that made me decide. The other thing was price points, and I think Rebecca can, can confirm or not, but at the time, as a resident, um, this course had the Commonwealth Support Place, so the government does subsidize a fair chunk of your fees, and that was uh, really important for me to um, can we, uh, also placements. Some universities expect you to find your own placements, and Rebecca will talk more about this after us, that Monash has a whole team that does this for you, which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so, you know, when we got here, uh, what we found was, um, um, I really enjoyed the fact that it was 100% coursework. <laughs> I enjoyed the, uh, you know, just how, how it was laid out. And um, so both of us did um, the Masters of Teaching for all early years in primary. And, um, you know, so it, it had a good mix of both of this, uh, uh, these areas and, um, you know, for the placements as well. So you had like your early years placements and then your primary. And um, definitely in, in the year that we started, um, this building was in the midst of construction and we were hoping that we would be able to enjoy it before we graduated. And yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. So um, like going back to what Rebecca said about the, the way this was designed, it's amazing. And this course, when I first started, I felt quite overwhelmed with the amount of readings we had to do and how we're going to handle all that. So it was really important for you guys, I guess, if when you joined, to try to find study groups. And we've made really good friends, and yeah. we shared readings, we talked about the assignments and yeah. how we were approaching it. It was very, very, very collaborative. Um, and one of the things I was also considered with um, the courses when it's comparing um, between universities is that Monash also had some, a, a quite a good mix between your own individual assignments and then um, teamwork assignments. So um, I, I quite like that. And this particular building was very conducive to collaborative work. You'll find it's amazing. I, we spend lots of hours here together, don't yes. we? Yes, we did. And um, yeah, you know, coming back to the, the assignments and, and just even the group work. And um, I think Monash differs in that point. They actually... Uh, there's, there's this thing called the agreement when it comes to uh, group work and I know that some of my friends in other universities, they really struggle. Um, so we received that support when we're, we were here and also in terms of resources, I know we had to sit for the land tide test and um, there's a lot of um, uh, free training, uh, there's a lot of um, different facilities and I, I think, um, Sue, you wanted to mention about the ICT guru? Yeah, but before even that, um, if you've never written a paper before, there's also support in, um, in how to write papers, how to cite, how to, to do your, your paragraph, what to write, so that's really great support that they do provide here for free. Um, there's also what we call the ICT Guru Program, which, I don't know your name, you can, <laughs> Luke. Luke is a, a great part of it, the sandbox, and they, they bring lots of cool STEM um, robots and things that you can try. And they even got a guy when I was here from Adobe. Yeah, and he came and he talked about all the amazing Adobe programs and got us to play with all of it. So it's a, um, it's a bonus. This is bonus stuff that you get when you're a student here. Yeah, yep. Bringing it all back. Um, the other thing, um, you know. Academics. Let's talk about the amazing lectures we do have here. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, when I was thinking about it, um, a special mention to Ali, Professor Ali Clements, because, like, she took time to just to even talk to me about, like, hey, you know, if uh, what's the possibilities out there, and then 
she encouraged me to do, um, you know, just just get out there, volunteer in schools if possible. Uh, in fact, the school that I'm working now, um, you know, she kind of like pointed me in that direction. Um, and also just having um, uh, even the uh, for placement, the uh, professional consultants, uh, Ondin Bradbury, she was really instrumental as well, you know, ensuring that the placements go smoothly. Uh, and Monash, they do play a hands-on role. So that means, let's just say, if you did face something out there and you're like, man, I have no one to talk to, or I'm having a bit of trouble, um, the uni does step in. So like for me, it was, it was a really good experience. Yeah. yeah. You also get a chance if you, you want a certain area to go to for your placement to request for it. So I had an interest with um, special ed and I was really lucky to be able to be placed in a primary school, which showed me how maybe mainstream should change. It was a really interesting setup. They had, um, subjects run every hour and a, 40, a 15 minutes break in between every subject, you know, things like that. So it was a really interesting and different way of running a school. Uh, and I also got to work in an early intervention program. So that was um, yeah, great opportunity. I think other, other friends got to work in Montessori or Steiner schools and IBL schools as well. Mm. That's right. And um, yeah, you can request to do your placements elsewhere or even international pl placements. Rebecca is probably going to touch on that later. Uh, I did a rural placement in Bendigo, um, you know, because um, I had a few connections there. Uh, a, they started a sister school in Malaysia, and I wanted to just see how things were, uh, were done over there, and that was great. Um, now we're going to move on to life after Monash, right? So, um, you know, putting it into practice. So after, I think sometime last year, this time we were looking for jobs and, and just going out there. Um, now that I'm working, I can, I can actually see that I'm, I am putting into practice what I learned and the, the assignments, like for example, um, for health and physical education, we did this massive assignment, which would cover a whole unit. And I could use that in my first term and also use it as part of my VIT project. So I would say it has not been a loss at all. Everything that I have um, learned or, or gained from Onash, I was able to put into practice. Yeah. And uh, we've come back here a couple of times, uh, a couple of times for the professional development, um, you know, different sessions, different topics uh, that come up and, um, uh, it's yeah, so that's been really value adding for me. Yeah, yeah and like we mentioned, there were a, a lot of um, amazing academics here, and one of the PDs that we've went to was um, a launch by Marilyn Fleur. If you haven't heard of her, you can look at look her up in the library, and you'll find books written by her in, on play and science. And she's recently um, launched this um, new approach of a conceptual play world that incorporates STEM for the little kitties, and that's some. Um, really exciting to see yeah. yeah yep so i think that's about all from us so yeah thank so you so wish much. you the very best of luck and welcome you to this profession soon thank you thank you so much thanks for that ladies that's great oh need my clicker <laughs> Uh, yeah, Mar Professor Marilyn Fleer is actually um, the recipient of the Australian Research Council uh, Laureate for Education, I think that's what it's called, uh, a Laureate Fellowship for Education last year, uh, which is basically one of the highest um, uh, grants that you can receive as an academic researcher in Australia. So she is an extremely high profile uh, academic researcher in education and we're very, very lucky to have her here in our faculty. She is doing some amazing work. Um, and there are so many examples of that which um, 
directly feed into those uh, academic rankings that I was mentioning earlier. Thank you so much, um, Charlene and Suzanne. Um, I am conveniently going to start talking about placements now. Um, so as a part of your degree, um, they were exactly right. Monash uh, organises minimum 60 days of placements for you as a part of your degree. If you're studying the early years and primary education specialisation, it's a bit higher than that because you need uh, some additional placement days to make sure that you're meeting all of the ASEQA requirements um, to get the different age groups of uh, early childhood education. Um, so in and outside of the classroom, so that was a great example um, that you can uh, do a rural placement if you want to, um, but you can also do placements um, outside of schools if you want to. There are opportunities that come up uh, at different times. So actually in the video I played earlier with Emily uh, doing her Drama Victoria placement, we've also had students go and work with um, Scouts Victoria, uh, the zoo, the Melbourne Museum, uh, various different things. So there's a lot of opportunities that pop up um, during the year and uh, students have the opportunity to, uh, to have a look at those. Uh, not everyone can do every placement opportunity, but um, there's definitely different things out there if you're keen. Um, and yes, international professional experience as well. So these are the different countries that we currently have uh, in the past year had students go to. Um, so there are lots and lots of different opportunities to go overseas as a part of your degree. Um, Usually the placements, uh, the international placements will run between two to four weeks and they're usually timed um, either in the summer holidays or more often in the winter, the mid-year break because um, you usually get sort of um, basically all of July off in between your semesters. Um, and so if you're doing an international placement then uh, usually that will fall within that time. Um, the students that I've spoken to that have done an international placement, a placement out of a school or a rural placement have all said to me that's the best thing that they've done, um, just to get that different perspective, the, those different ways of being able to apply the knowledge and the skills that you're learning. Um, so definitely take a look at those if you do end up uh, studying with us. Tony. <laughs> we also have our current student, Tony, who's going to say a few words. We put him on the spot this evening. Oh. Hey, um, my name is Tony and currently I'm doing Master of Teaching in Secondary and uh, so my major is Business and Economics. So, because um, I was in business background, so when I first came to uh, education field, it's quite hard for me for the first semester because the theory, everything you never touched or learned before, and a lot of readings you have to do. So it's quite challenging for me for the first semester. Um, but once you get on it, and then everything's going to be easy for you, I think. <laughs> and um, just some tips for you guys for the course. Actually, Master of Teaching is quite intense, um, especially you have to do the placement, you have to do the assignments, everything. And it's 15 days placement. Um, sometimes the assignments do the same day after you finish your placement, so it's quite intense. And the tip one is just to be efficient to uh, the time management for you guys. Um, so you have to how to cooperate with your time with the placement, because it's gonna be so exhausting every day in the placement school. Get up like six or seven or something and then finish at five p.m. And and after that you have to collect data for your uh, ass assessment. So and you have to do your assignments, everything. So just be. I don't know, um, be efficient time management skills for you guys. And the second one is uh, if you have some issues in terms of your um, placement, um, just talk to the um, professional practi practice team. And because I remember I had uh, something going on during the placement, uh, I have to leave for one week. So I talked to the to, to the team uh, a, a week before. So they actually did something to help me to to arrange this placement and then there are also other options for your uh, placement. I think, do they have like a part-time one, once a week? Did yeah, you have so, this? Um, is that micro? Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, there, there are sometimes opportunities to vary your placement arrangements if you need to. Yeah, so if, if you're having difficulties, if you've got extenuating circumstances, you can put in what they call a placement variation request. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so if you have anything, any troubles, just email to the um, professional practice, practice team. And the third one is um, make use of the resources at the university. Um, there are a lot of workshops, They're actually good to, for your professional development, and just attend it. And yeah, I think it's really good, like to um, enhance your knowledge about teaching in different topics. Um, the last one, I guess, is just to be um, collaborative because um, there are a lot of Facebook groups you can join and then they always, because teachers, they always share resources. And for example, textbook and you know uh, the learning activity task sheet and sort of things. So I guess just to be more proactive to join these kind of groups. And they, always, they also um, have, um, I guess, uh, some some events for 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 the, for the pre-service teachers, such as um, like job advertising sort of things and resources. Just um, join this kind of group. And the last one, I guess, just when you are in the placement school, so be prepared, be ready, and ask the teachers or ask the school, uh, ask your mentor whether there's an uh, opportunity for you guys to be able to do such as volunteer works or sort of things to to be proactive actually to just to get these opportunities for your learning and yeah, everything. Yeah. Great, thank you, Tony. Yeah, I think that's some really good points and um, reiterating a lot of what um, Suzanne and Charlene said earlier. Um, support is a big thing, I think, um, especially if, uh, you know, obviously everyone in this room is going to have a different background, a different story for them. Um, but if you're coming back to study maybe after a significant period of time, um, then you might not have as much confidence with writing assignments and those sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, as, as mentioned, uh, we do have a lot of support. Uh, I think, yeah, the main thing is just being aware that there is support for you. Uh, all you have to do is ask um, and there's plenty of resources available. Uh, and placements as well, the support available in placements. Um, so Tony mentioned the, the PPCs, Professional Practice Consultants. Um, so they are a branch out of our um, professional experience department. We also have the professional experience office. Um, so they perform different functions so that we make sure we've got the full array of support for you. So you have the more, I guess, administrative support in terms of making sure all the paperwork and all of those things are done and all of the things that you need to, all of the requirements that you need to do are met. But you also have the support of these professional practice consultants who actually were teachers before they came to, to work with Monash. So they work as a bit of a a liaison between you and the professional experience office and the school that you're doing your placement with. So they can really help you uh, with any of the problems that you might experience. Um, there's always some sort of challenge. Um, every student says to me that the best and the most challenging part of their degree was placements. Um, I'm sure that you would agree with that as well. Um, yeah, so, so there is support available and uh, yeah, just, just need to ask. So into a bit of nitty gritty, sorry the writing's a little bit small on this, but it is pretty straightforward in terms of the entry requirements for the course. So for all of the specialisations, as I mentioned at the very start, you do need the equivalent of an Australian bachelor degree. Um, and we're looking for, to be able to apply, you need at least a pass average. So minimum 50% average. The reason we say uh, pass average instead of successful completion is because uh, we do include uh, any failed units in that average. So if you're averaging out the, the scores that you've had throughout your undergrad, you need to include the, any failed units that you might have had um, as well as all the ones that you passed with flying colours. Um, so that's the minimum. The requirement may be higher um, and the reason we say this is because we can't give you an exact score because applicants are ranked as part of the assessment 
process. Um, so if you have a pass average, we definitely encourage you to apply. We just don't guarantee that you will definitely get an offer because it will depend on the number of applicants for the course um, and the way they've performed academically as well. It also depends on the number of places in your particular specialisation and those sorts of things too. Um, and more specific entry requirements. As I mentioned, uh, it's really important that you understand that for primary and secondary education or secondary education, for that secondary area, you need to have a background in the areas that you want to teach. So for secondary, as I mentioned, you need two areas from that list I showed earlier, or one double area. Um, and for primary and secondary, you need one area that you've studied previously. Um, and yeah, on the website, there's a lovely little list that lays out everything um, for one particular area. You might have have needed a minor area of study as part of your degree. For others, you might need a major. Um, so it just depends. Um, and I do actually want to mention as well as a part of that, it really is about the actual content that you've studied as a part of your degree. It's not about what your degree title is. Um, so for example, you might have studied a Bachelor of Engineering. There's no engineering subject in high school. Um, there's lots that are related to engineering, but there's no specific engineering subject. That doesn't mean that you can't do a Master of Teaching in secondary education. What it means is we'll be looking at your transcripts and we'll be finding the units that you've done as a part of your Bachelor of Engineering and matching them up to the most appropriate uh, specialist teaching areas. So for engineering, you might have done, you probably have done a lot of physics fair bit of maths and maybe some chemistry, maybe some biology as well. Um, so depending on how much you've done of each area, that will help to match up for your specific um, specialist teaching areas. Now, the final entry requirement um, is this little thing called CASPA, which, uh, how many of you have heard of CASPA in the room? Probably about a bit over half, yep, great. Um, so I am going to play a little video um, just explaining what CASPA is for those of you who don't know um, and uh, I might just talk about that just after it plays. The steps you need to take to apply for initial teacher education or ITE courses have changed. Why the change? Anyone can learn, but not everyone can teach. It takes gifted, hardworking people who are just as passionate about inspiring young people as they are about educating them. To help find those people, the Victorian Framework for Selection into ITE has been developed. From 2018, all entry into ITE courses will include a non-academic selection component that measures an applicant's personal attributes as much as their grades or ATAR score. At Monash, this applies to our Bachelor of Education Honours course, including double degrees and the Master of Teaching. Some of the attributes that you'll need to demonstrate include how motivated you are to teach, your interpersonal and communication skills, your willingness to learn, and your organisational and planning skills. To implement this, we'll be using CASPER, an online screening tool designed to assess important personal and professional qualities against the selection framework. Don't worry, we're not changing our academic selection standards. CASPA is an additional admission criteria, similar to how an interview might be used when considering someone for employment. With CASPA, your responses won't be checked for things like spelling and grammar. Instead, you'll be assessed on how well you tackle the ethical and professional situations put forward. There are no right or wrong answers, just answers that reflect you and how suitable you may be for teaching. With the introduction of CASPA, we're making sure that all of our students have the qualities needed to become great teachers. So when you study with Monash, you'll be surrounded by like-minded people who are committed to inspiring young, developing minds. To find out more, head to the website. So that's Casper. Um, a couple of takeaways from that video, definitely uh, the spelling and grammar are not important thing. Um, so that's Casper does have a time limit on it. So um, the top 
tip for when you're sitting in Casper is to try not to overthink things and edit your answers because there's not a huge amount of time for the actual um, answering of the questions. Um, so the best thing you, that you can do is watch the, the it's video based, watch the videos, um, look at the questions, have a quick think and then just type. Um, also in mentioning typing, um, that's something else that someone has mentioned previously to me. If you're not the most experienced typer, if you don't have to type very often in whatever you currently are doing, um, maybe have a bit of a practice beforehand and, and just make sure that you um, feel like you're able to, to type your thoughts down um, as you think of them. Um, because if you're not used to typing, then that might present a challenge if that's something that you're doing for the first time in a long time when you actually go to sit Casper. Um, the Casper website actually has some really useful resources on it. Um, so takecasper.com is the Casper website and you can also get there through the Monash Casper website um, that's listed in our course guide. Um, so that's where you can find all of the dates um, for Casper. Um, and it's where you can also, uh, you register for your test date. Um, and it's also where you can find uh, a lot of sample questions and examples as well. Um, especially after you register for the test, you'll actually get access to more um, example questions that you can have a look at. So, I mean, you can't study for CASPA because it's not an academic test. Um, it's based on personal attributes. But you can prepare for it. You, just like any other test, it is easier if you know what the structure is going to be like, if you have an understanding of how it all works. So that's another, I guess, top tip is make sure that you do have a look at those practice questions just to get a sense of what they're like. Um, because it will make a difference. Um, you won't be surprised on the day and uh, have to deal with um, that processing of, okay, this is how it works before you actually get down to business of answering. Uh, don't be scared. It's not designed to exclude a huge number of uh, students. It's just an extra hurdle that you have to complete as part of your assessment. Um, so, how to apply. Um, there's a couple of different ways um, and it's different depending on whether you are uh, what we consider a domestic student or an international student. Um, so if you're a domestic student, so an Australian or New Zealand citizen or an Australian permanent resident um, or on a permanent um, uh, protection visa in Australia, uh, then you apply direct to Monash. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, just filling stuff in online, um, uploading scans of your documents. Um, at the application stage, you don't need to provide certified copies of things. Um, a random sampling of students may be required to provide uh, certified copies of official documents from their application. Um, after the actual application and enrolment process, but not everyone will have to do that. Just be aware that you might be asked to do that um, as part of our auditing process. Um, so you just need to upload your documents, fill in all the different forms um, and pop your application in. We go by rounds, so as I said, um, applicants uh, are ranked um, and assessed uh, as a group. So we have two rounds round for domestic students. Round one is currently open um, and will close on the 31st of October. Um, and offers for that will be released uh, late November, um, maybe into early December. Um, and then round two opens in January for anyone that missed that initial round and still wants an opportunity to study with us. Um, as I can't remember who mentioned it, um, uh, maybe it was Suzanne, I think, but there are Commonwealth supported places available for domestic students. Um, and that is uh, the vast majority of domestic students um, come in on a Commonwealth supported place. So that is students that have their fees subsidised by the government. Um, so um, you're going through the government loan system, you're paying a lot less in fees and you don't have to pay them up front, just like your undergraduate degree. 
Um, international students, the process is a little bit different. You can still apply to Monash or you can apply through a Monash accredited education agent. Um, either way is fine, we don't mind. Um, and applications are actually um, rolling applications and rolling offers because um, of the different visa requirements for international students. And your final closing date for applications is the 24th of January. Um, so just to bear that in mind, but obviously if you're applying for a visa, the earlier you can apply, the better. Um, CASPA, so I've got the CASPA website up there actually. Um, so apply for your course first and then use the Monash student ID number that you're allocated as part of the application process to register for CASPA. Um, that's really important because um, we don't actually administer CASPA. CASPA is administered by a third party body that looks after all of the uh, assessments so that it's done independently of Monash, independently assessed, um, which means that we then are relying on the ability to connect you, for CASPA to connect you with Monash. Because CASPA is used by a number of different universities in Victoria, um, there, if you don't put your Monash student ID number, there's a chance that your CASPA results won't get matched up with Monash in the first instance. Doesn't mean that they never will, but it might take a fair bit longer and there's a chance, for example, that you might miss out on, on your first round offer because they didn't come through or something like that. So just to be aware when you're registering for CASPA, um, we would prefer you to actually apply for your course first and use that Monash student number to be able to do that. Now, I think that's all the course information I had for you, but what I might do now is invite our speakers to come back onto the stage. Um, and I'll also, so Suzanne and Charlene and also Tony, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up here. Um, and I'm also going to ask um, Elise and May, yep, there they are, um, from our student services and admissions teams to come down and um, have a chat if anyone has any questions. I think actually Tony might have had to leave. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. We can answer any questions you had. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off this little Madonna mic. I'm going to pass a microphone to you lovely ladies. I'll get you to all stand together in a row if you don't mind so it's easier for the live streamers to see you. I'm going to switch off my mic and go into the audience. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions about the course? Oh, yep. Just come over here. I'm curious of the contact hours. Sure. Uh, so contact hours, um, who wants to answer? <laughs> I'll give it a go. Alrighty. Um, it depends on the specialisation that you're doing. So normally for most of our units in Master of Teaching, they're weighted at six credit points. Usually it's about three hours a week um, for each unit. So normally about 12 hours per week, but it will depend on what's, what the structure is for each of the classes. Um, so it's kind of not really a single answer. Depends as well if you're doing your placement. So normally how we work it is when you're on placement, you don't have to come into the classes for your units. You've got some time off. Um, I'd say probably 12 to 15 as an estimate. I know we've got a couple of academic staff in here, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, gives you a good idea. Yeah, of course. Even though the contact hours are, are small, there's a lot of work that um, you need to put away to do all the readings, because that's quite a huge load, actually, the readings and the, all that. I think I'll add as well. Um, as Beck was saying before, and as you were both saying before, we're so lucky to have this beautiful building. Um, a lot of assessment tasks that you're doing, we've got a lot of group work, that kind of thing. So even though you're not in scheduled classes, you might find that you're still on campus um, for more time, like you said, doing your readings and meeting with people, just enjoying the spaces, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, I just want to mention as well, enjoying the fact that we don't have any exams in our faculty. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> so there won't be any exam assessments. 
Um, actually, I did just want to mention, because I, I asked May and Elise to come up without really explaining who they are. So May, May is actually from our, uh, mainly from our admissions um, team. So she does uh, most of the assessments for the Master of Teaching. She's um, busy, busy at the moment doing assessments, um, pre-assessments for things. Um, and Elise works more on the student support side of things. So uh, your official title is Education Success advisor. Correct. Got it right. Yes. Do you want to just really briefly explain what that's about? Sure. Um, so probably for both of you, you might not have had too much to do with the advising team, but what we've done from about October last year is we've actually changed our student services model. Um, if you do come into one of our teaching courses here or into any of our courses at education, you actually get an individual advisor that will look after you from when you commence until when you graduate. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's worked out well so far. <laughs> Um, so I think we've got about eight, eight staff members who are Education Success Advisors. We all look after a certain caseload of students. Um, so really what we're here to do is if you've got questions, particularly because Monash is such a big university, um, you don't have to kind of search around on our websites and try and find the person you need to talk to. You just come along to have a chat to your advisor. We can do email, phone and in-person appointments. Um, and then we can link you up with all of the services that you need. So we're just kind of here to um, hopefully streamline the student services experience for everyone. Thank you. Now, did anyone have, oh, there's actually a question on the live stream. I'll come over to Jennifer. There's actually 10 questions on the live wow, stream at the moment. That. Yeah, okay. Um, so we'll probably go by chronological order, yeah. So the first question was, I'm domestic Commonwealth supported student. I just wanted to ask uh, if I have to pay the full annual student contribution amount upfront during semester one? No. <laughs> is the short answer. Um, as a Commonwealth supported student, uh, your your fees, so they're heavily subsidised by the government, so you won't be paying full fees, but even the fees that you do pay, you don't actually pay them up front. They go onto basically a government loan um, and you repay those through the tax system. Um, so once you hit a particular earning threshold, um, then you'll start to pay your fees through tax. The loan is interest free, it's just increases by indexation every year. So effectively it's an interest free loan. Uh, indexation, all that is, is keeping up with the, um, basically the cost of living and wages in Australia. So um, it basically balances everything out. So no, you don't have to pay your fees while you're studying. You can, if you want to, make upfront contributions, but that's not required as a Commonwealth Supported Place student. Thank you. Can I go to question two, or do should we? Uh, yeah, let's go Any? to the second one, and then. Oh, I'll okay. Off. All right. Sorry. Um, a couple of questions about Casper and when to take it. So, if I took Casper this December, would I qualify for the first round offer or second round offer? So you can have a look on the Casper Dates website. So uh, I don't know the dates off the top of my head, but it will be you probably won't qualify for round one if you're taking a December test. So there are tests available from August onwards. There should be one coming up soon in October. So that, was, that would be the one that we recommend because we do have that 31st October deadline as well. So if you are looking at being considered for round one, then we do recommend that you start on your application soon and also register for Casper by then. Otherwise, you will be looking at round two offers in that case. Okay. Um. And also just to add to that, um, we also recommend that you don't leave it to the last minute to register for the CASPER date because um, it, it goes through the CASPER system, the website, and it might take a couple of days for you to actually get confirmation of your uh, place in the test. Um, so if you can, try and register maybe a, a week before or something like that. Um, yeah. Now, there was a question over here. Oops, sorry. Squeeze through here. So I wanted to ask if you do your Master of Teaching in the accelerated version, so you're doing one over the summer, um, does that change the placement at all? Elise, do you want to take this one? Um, you do your placement over the summer semester. 
Yeah, so you do your first placement in semester one. The first year of the standard and the accelerated course is more or less the same. Um, the main difference is then once semester two is finished the first year, in I think this year our summer semester is starting in mid-October, you do your units that the standard students would do in semester one of the next year, you do them in summer, um, and you do your placement during that summer period as well. So then you come back for semester one the next year and course complete at the end of semester one at mid-year. But you're not expected to come to classes and do placement at the same time? I don't believe so. The summer, the summer semester is what we call an intensive teaching period, so it's not a full 12 weeks. Um, you're expected to be on campus usually between nine to five um, each day of the week for probably two or three weeks. Kind of, that's how we have it structured this year. It might change slightly. Um, but yeah, it's similar to a standard semester, but just a lot more intensive. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify with the CASPER test, so if you're applying to multiple universities and they all require you to do the test, you'll be doing it multiple times for each university. You can't use your score. Do you want me to answer that? Sure, yeah. So with, yeah. with CASPER, basically when you register, you also list all the institutions that you're applying for. So you only sit for CASPER once per that one year cycle. So you can nominate basically Monash and any other institution and then provide your student ID or applicant ID. And then once you've done CASPER, CASPER will then send the results to the respective institutions. Yeah. So that's good news. You don't have to sit it more than once. <laughs> And actually, I'll also just um, just mention that as I walk over to the next question, um, that the CASPER requirements may be different from university to university. So even if you're um, unsuccessful with CASPER at Monash, you may actually meet the requirement for another university that you're applying for. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, students interested in this course uh, want to be a registered teacher after they've uh, finished their course. So, uh, but I, I, I know that uh, for the VIT registration, they have their uh, requirement. So uh, before the uh, students apply for this course, will Monash uh, assess the condition of the student to make sure that the student, when they finish this course, they can successfully apply for this VIT certificate? Can give it a go. <laughs> um, well, the course is accredited with VIT, so if you complete your course, you'll be eligible to apply for registration with VIT. There's some differences, and things should always be checked with VIT because a lot of the accreditation requirements change. So, um, you know, things like English language. Sometimes some students may need to do some extra things for English language um, or that kind of thing. But generally, I think you wouldn't complete the entire course and then be told by VIT that it doesn't qualify for teacher registration, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that's right. And if you don't mind, I'll just add to that. Please. Since I'm so close to the front, I'll pop here so the live streamers can see me as well. Um, so, so yes, if you complete our course, you will have completed um, all of the requirements for VIT registration, except potentially, as Elise mentioned, the English language requirement if you didn't do uh, all of your studies uh, in Australia. Uh, there may be an additional requirement. Maybe you might need to sit an additional English language test or provide further evidence. Um, what was the other thing? I've forgotten the other thing I was going to mention. Um, no, oh, I know what I was going to mention. Sorry, had a blank for a moment. Um, so, uh, someone earlier mentioned the land tight. Uh, um, yes, so um, just in case any of you heard that and didn't know what it was, um, there is an additional requirement that you need to do before you graduate from your teaching degree, before you can register. It's called the land tight. It's the National Literacy and Numeracy Test for Initial Teacher Education. A bit of a mouthful, um, but basically um, it's an Australia-wide requirement um, that you need to pass a literacy test and a numeracy test uh, before you graduate from your teaching degree so that you can then go and apply for registration. At Monash, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Elise, but um, we ask you to sit that in your first year. Um, Mainly so you can get it over and done with. <laughs> um, it's nothing to be worried about. The vast majority of students pass it the first time around. Um, it's not at a super high level. Um, but if for any reason you are having issues, 
as mentioned previously, um, I think by Charlene, um, there is support available. There is a lot of support available. So even if you're concerned in the lead up, there's support available, but also if for some reason you don't do well and you don't meet the requirement the first time around, there is an opportunity to reset um, at least twice more. Um, so, and we provide a lot of resources to help you to help make sure that you're up to the level you need to be. So it's nothing to worry about. It's just something to be aware of that it is one extra um, condition that you need to meet before you graduate your course um, and the VIT will allow you to register. It's not a requirement for early childhood education, so early years. If you're just doing the early years specialisation, you don't have to do it. But anything involving primary or secondary education, you do because it's directly connected to the Victorian Institute of Teaching registration process. Now, I think I saw there was one here and then I'll head up to the back as well. Um, I would ask actually like a specific question because like I already work full time job um, from seven or eight until three and four, and I work in an early childhood idea, like I'm an educator already. So uh, my question is like if there are lectures that for a specific sub 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 of a specific subject in the morning, what would I, is there options like in the evening or like take them online or something or what are my options? Um. We've got a range of different class times. It kind of partially depends on the timetable for each year. I think, as Beck mentioned before, if you're interested in primary education, we do have the online offering. Um, all of our other specialisations are offered on campus. We don't have a formal attendance requirement, but we strongly encourage attendance at all classes, just because, um, you know, in order to complete your assessments, you need to be engaging with the content in each of the tutorial sessions. Um, so it's kind of something that it's difficult to answer until you see the timetable. Normally, because they're quite big courses, we'll have a number of different options for class times. Um, our timetabling system is a preference-based system, so you can put your preferences in for the times that suit you the best. Uh, and then it's a case of, you know, working out, I guess, the priority between work and study and trying to sort out the schedule between them. So, so like. So you mentioned like each uh, lecture or subject like maybe have like and two options maybe like uh, different timings. And yeah, it, de it depends on the unit. So you might find that um, in the secondary and primary and secondary course because you do your method units. Just say you're in, I think business management this year. There's only one class time because it's quite a small method okay. in 2019. Um, so it's. It kind of depends on the unit, right. yeah. So normally there would be likely one lecture, um, but the tutorials would probably have a number number of different options. Um, and about the placement, like um, obviously, like uh, I'm already working in an early setting, so like would I be able to do like apply to work to do the placement in the place that I already work, or like should I be going to another place? I think you could certainly ask the question. <laughs> um, Please. Yeah, sure. If you don't mind. Um, so we do, we do have a rule that you can complete up to 50% of your placements um, in your current place of work. So as long as that's um, an approved, uh, it meets all the requirements of supervision and, and placements, and it's approved by the um, by the placements team, there is potential for you to do um, some placements at your place of work. You wouldn't be able to do all of them there, though. Um, just for the sake of exposure to different um, different opportunities and areas, yeah. 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 And like, if I wanted to do the placement in uh, like in another place, like, would it have to be like um, like each like 15 continuous days, or could I like apply for have it like once a week over like a long period of time? So like, I would actually be able to leave work for like this day during a week, like, or. Yeah, sure. Um, I think Beck mentioned before, we do have a placement variation uh, kind of system. So you can certainly apply to have a varied placement schedule. Normally, um, it depends again on the unit that you're doing and the specialisation that you're doing, but it might be five days completed over three weeks. Um, and then you might have some flexibility working with the school or the placement location to work out which days within that three week block you can attend. Um, so there's certainly some flexibilities, but again, it's something that once you're enrolled and you know what your placement requirements are, um, you'd work with our professional experience office to see what can be done. Yeah. 
Is yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's not necessarily a 15 day block, you know, three weeks full in a row. Um, and we do release the placement calendar calendars in advance. So the 2020 calendars are actually up on our website right now. Um, so if you, even if you were just to Google Monash place, um, teaching placement calendars, that'd probably pop up. Um, and you can have a look at the different specialisations and see what the planned placement blocks are. Um, for your particular um, your particular specialisation for next year to get a sense of what that looks like, and if you might need to um, try to work with the placements team to see if you can vary your placement time timing at all. Yeah. Uh, I did see one up right up the back earlier, and then I will pop over to the other side, and then I'll also come down to Jennifer for the live stream. Um, Similar to the last question, is it possible to sort of um, do it part-time so you can balance it with full-time work, say do it over three years rather than the two? Happy for me to answer this. Um, the course is offered formally in full-time mode. You can request to underload, so studying part-time we refer to as underloading, so you can request to do maybe two units a semester or three units a semester. Um, it would come to our team and then we would work out if we could approve it. If you're an international student, you do have to be enrolled full-time, but if you're a domestic student, we can sometimes work out some flexibilities. Um, there are certain rules around the study load that you have to complete um, and there's certain, you know, you might have to complete one unit before you can complete another, so there would be impacts on how long it takes you to complete the course. Um, I think the best way to think of it is that it is a full-time course, um, but you can ask the question once you come in and I think you have a maximum of five years to complete the entire degree. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that as well, I, th I think that the standard... Um, if, if you are approved for an underload, the standard would be that you'd basically have to do 50% of the standard full-time load um, just because of those course progression issues. Um, so it it wouldn't there wouldn't be a huge amount of flexibility in terms of, oh, this semester I want to only do one unit and next semester I want, I want to do three units. It does need to be fairly standardised just because of the requirements that we have as part of the course structure and the way that the units flow on from one another. But yeah, you can definitely ask the question. And we do have students that underload. Um, it's just we can't 100% guarantee that you'll be able to do it um, before you've um, applied and got your offer. You'd need to work that out with the student services team and your education success advisor. Um, now, I might just pop down to the live stream so we don't neglect those, and then I'll pop over to the other side. Um, is psychology listed as one of the specialist areas? Short answer, no. <laughs> so um, at Monash we don't actually offer psychology as one of the specialisations for secondary teaching, for the Master of Teaching. Um, the quick answer as to why that is, is because we can't guarantee that we have enough placements for that particular method area. Um, it's a very, very... Um, high demand area in terms of student demand. It's not a huge demand area in terms of teacher demand. So at Monash, we don't actually offer that because we don't, um, we don't feel like we have the capacity to offer the placements that are required for that particular area. So if you did study a psychology degree and you're looking at doing secondary education, it would be a case of needing to needing to find, sorry, microphone cut out, um, needing to find another area that you've studied as part of your degree, so um, or two areas if, if you're looking at secondary, or one area, and we could look at putting you into the primary and secondary um, specialisation. Um, otherwise, unfortunately, you, you wouldn't be able to study secondary education at Monash. Um, okay, one more for the last one. Okay. If I choose to do Masters of Teaching in Primary and Secondary Teaching, does this mean I only have time to choose one specialist area even though I'm qualified to teach two areas with respect to my bachelor degree? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so because it's the dual sector course, um, the easiest way I find to think of it is that instead of having two method areas, your second method is filled with the primary education units. So you've just got the one secondary education method. I think. It's worth 
looking into the VIT um, discipline information, just because it doesn't necessarily mean you can't teach in other areas. It's just that your kind of expert area that you study within your course that will be against your transcript, you'll just have the one. That's right, yeah, and um, just to add to that, um, when you register as a teacher with the VIT, you're registering as a teacher. You're not registering as a primary school teacher or a high school history teacher or a maths teacher. Um, you're registering as a teacher. And it's then up to the discretion of the principal or the, the hiring body of the school that you're applying for a job at as to whether they're willing to hire you um, to teach what they need you to teach. So we do actually have graduates that teach outside of their specialist teaching areas in high schools. We can't, recommend, we can't guarantee that you would be able to get a job um, for a teaching specialist area that you haven't done those specific method units for, but it definitely does happen. Now there was a question, okay. Oh. Um, so there's a lot of research into um, creative and innovative um, approaches to education. I was just interested in how Monash applies those pedagogies in the way that you deliver the course itself. Now, I know that we have an academic staff member here. I'm just wondering, Roland, <laughs> can I put you on the spot? <laughs> I don't know if you heard that question. Um, we were just asked about how the innovation in um, pedagogy, in, in innovation in research is applied through the work that we do in the teaching of our courses here at Monash. So what kind of innovation do, I know you do a lot of cool stuff in your, <laughs> in your classes. Did I yeah. It's changed. I mean, the way that we work, the way that we connect, and the way that we relate to each other has changed. Teaching isn't just about me talking, you listening, making notes. It's not even about watching back on the video recording. I mean, think about it. You're going to be your 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 time lords. Does anyone watch Doctor Who? Oh, good. There's hope for some of you. <laughs> you are standing in a room. You're looking at a child, you're thinking about when they graduate, you're thinking about what they've come from, where they're going to. So you have a time perspective. So you're going to be innovative. You're looking at collecting artefacts about them and moving forward. But you're doing it for different classes at different times. We move in time and space in a way that's unique for any profession. Medicine comes close. A different someone's treatment, the interventions you might have, and the health, and you'll be doing it at different stages. We have digital tools that allow us to capture that knowledge and to reflect on it and to dive in deep. I just came from a, um, a hangout I did with a class, and I've never met the students before. It's done entirely online. And it's not just a Zoom class where they're watching me talk. They're watching me move my hands. I'm engaging with them. They take control of the camera. We talk, we discuss, discuss, deliberate. I'm using tools like Trello for being able to schedule activities. I'm using tools like social media for being able to show them what Sally Starfish. You can look it up, by the way, in Twitter. If you're on Facebook or social media, wonderful science educator who knows how to communicate with people and who shares and collaborates and builds and adds value. And that innovation is important but then doing it in a way that understands it is a double-edged sword because it's got to be something that can amplify good behaviour and amplify obnoxious behaviour and being able to do it in ways. What Monash is an innovator above, I'd say, many other universities is that we know how to use these tools in a way that can make the world a better place to live in, that makes you a better teacher. And we have good research that underpins the importance and value of relationships in that, the importance of video feedback and informing that, and being able to move that forward. Thanks, Roland. I absolutely put him on the spot just then. <laughs> I had no idea he was even coming to this event, so thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, Roland teaches into our IT method in the Master of Teaching, so if you're uh, doing that one, then you'll have the joy of working with him and hearing about all of his cool stories about, uh, I don't know, Mars landings and um, 
uh, solar pa solar powered vehicles in the desert and <laughs> all sorts of different things. Um, great. So hopefully that a little bit answered your question. Yep, fantastic. Now I did see someone here. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at doing the Masters of Teaching, the secondary. Um, are physical education and health two methods I can do? Yes, absolutely. So if you have completed either an undergraduate or postgraduate qualification, so with PE we are looking at um, things such as um, physiology, motor skills, um, team sports, for example, and there's also an additional requirement that you must have your OSWIM as well. So that is a requirement we do expect students to meet before we do assess them for PE. And then with health, there are a couple of health units, health, nutrition, family units as well. So for health, we are looking at a minor. So generally, that's about four units in the health area. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, is this able to be done online or is it all on campus? So mostly it would be on campus for our secondary education. So I'm, I'm just finishing my degree at the moment this semester, um, so obviously I won't be able to um, have my certificate before the 31st of October. What documents do you need to have to apply before the deadline? So if you are, so you're currently doing an undergraduate qualification and is it semester two that you're in or is it trimester? Semester two, okay, if that's the case, I assume your results would be coming out about mid-December, mid yes. If that's the case, you are looking at round two offers. What you can do is you can definitely apply first if you do have a transcript with all of your units, um, also the enrolled units that you are enrolled in, you can definitely submit that. We do recommend that you sit for your CASPER as well. And what we can offer you would be a conditional offer, being that you do complete your course with at least that 50% average, and then of course meeting Casper as well. But yeah, that would be round two offers. And then with OSWIM, we do recommend that you get it done as soon as possible. And then once you do, we will make that a condition on your conditional offer as well. So once you do get your OSWIM cert, you'll just have to send it through. Um, so I'm just going to come back to Jen with the live stream. I do just want to flag that we only have officially five minutes left um, of the duration of the of the evening. Um, so I'm just, um, as I get Jen to ask a question from the live stream, I'm going to head down and flick to the next slide, which mentions um, a follow-up event that we actually have coming up um, in early October. If you still have questions, we're running a webinar as well. So you're welcome to log on to that. But Jen, a question. Is it possible to start the course in semester two? No. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about the language requirements? Um, so I'm assuming for an international student or some... Um, so if you're an international student or you haven't completed your studies in Australia, um, we are looking for, and may correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we're looking for a seven IELTS overall, an academic seven, um, with two bands that I can never remember which ones they are of 7.5 and two bands uh, no lower than seven. Do you remember which bands they I are? I don't remember the bands, but if you just do a Google search, yeah. um, Monash, I think there is an English language requirements website. Someone has just kindly handed me our course guide. Thank you so much. Um, so we're looking at uh, a 7.5 for speaking and listening and a 7.0 for reading and writing. Thank you for that. Um, oh, so many. Um, so I was wondering if, um, I was thinking of doing the primary and secondary education combined specialization. So, um, so my bachelor's degree is in English, so let's say, for example, I apply and so I, I have, I would, so for, for, for the purpose of admission, I would choose English as that one specialist area because that's what my degree is in, and then I get into the course. Once I'm in the course, can I then apply for, uh, like, a study a different specialist area, like, say, maths? 
So generally, that would depend on the qualification you've completed. So when we do assess you, generally we do recommend that students also put in a personal statement, just listing what specializations they want to be considered for. So when we do assess you, we do list, we do offer you one, for example, for primary and secondary, we do offer you one teaching specialist area, but we also have a list of other qualification, sorry, other specialist areas that you qualify for. So if you do want to change, that is possible. In your, in your case, for example, if you do want to change to math, you must have done prior studies in maths. So you must have a minor in maths within that English degree. And also something to note is it doesn't have to be done within your bachelor's. So for example, if you do a bachelor's in English, but then you've gone and done four units, four single units in maths, you can also possibly qualify for maths. So that's a way to meet that other specialist areas. That's a really good point. We do actually get quite a few students that have completed a bachelor degree and then um, go and do extra units in a different area, either at Monash or at a different university through Open Universities Australia. Um, and if you meet the requirements for that particular specialist area, then we can accept that. Um, I should note as well um, the, the idea of changing your um, chosen method or chosen specialist area after you've got your offer or accepted your offer, it is possible but it's not guaranteed. When you're accepting your offer that we give you, you're accepting the methods as well. Um, so if you then come and enrol and talk to your student success advisor and say that you want to change methods, um, we can certainly look at it for you but we can't guarantee that we'll be able to do that because we, we plan our class load um, and we make our offers based on the applications that we have and the offers that are made um, and there's a lot of flow on effect from the, the methods and the um, specialist areas that we offer so I definitely can't guarantee it so we would definitely encourage you as May said when you're submitting your application if you're applying for primary and secondary or for secondary attach a word document it doesn't have to be like a an essay it can just be something you know, very simple, just saying, you know, my preferences for my specialist teaching areas are as follows. And, you know, list, if you think that you've got three, list your top three in order of preference and May and the team will do their utmost to, to give you the, the ones that you prefer. I'll come over. I think this might have to be the last question. Apologies. They make it a good one. <laughs> um, just want to know um, what's the roughly the class sizes. So, how many people do you accept onto each program, and is there a like international versus domestic ratio that you're looking at for that? I don't know the numbers yet, to be honest. So, it will depend on our course load planning. But generally, what we probably do recommend is, you know, if you think that you have a strong application, then definitely just do submit your application. It will be ranked as Beck had mentioned, but at this stage we don't have numbers yet. Thank you, and I'm so sorry. I know there are more questions in the room and online, but I think that we're going to have to wrap things up. Um, Thank you very much for coming along and for tuning in online. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a follow-up webinar up on the screen at the moment. Um, this is part of a suite of webinars that the university is offering. So when you go to that webpage, you'll see a number of different uh, topics for different courses listed. So just have a look for the Master of Teaching one. Feel free to sign up. We will have a brief presentation at the start of that webinar. You'll see me talking again, but not for very long, not for as long as tonight. The, really, the idea behind this one is a Q&A. So I'll go through some very basic, brief course information, and then we'll just open up to questions. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to get any questions that weren't answered tonight answered online. Otherwise, of course, you're more than welcome to contact us at any time. Um, on the back of the course guide, there are contact details for the faculty um, through the university. Um, and we also have our student services area on level one in this building open um, during the weekdays. Uh, we have lovely students that um, staff that desk throughout the week and uh, 
they can help answer a lot of questions. If they can't answer a question, they'll call me and uh, or my colleague Jen and we'll come down if we're uh, at our desk and have a chat with you. So um, please, there are lots and lots of different ways you can get answers. So if you haven't got your question answered, don't feel like tonight is the end and you're never going to find out. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our speakers tonight. Thank you particularly to Charlene and Suzanne uh, for coming along and giving up their precious time in the school holidays um, and uh, hope to see you at Monash next year.